Right, uh, so hello everyone and welcome to this first uh, seminar in our uh, Trinity term schedule. Today our speaker is Sonia Contara. Uh, Sonia is a professor of biological physics at the physics department of the University of Oxford and she also serves as the associate head of, uh, for equality, diversity and inclusion. Her work is at the interface of physics, biology and nanotechnology and she is interested also in how biological shape relates to information processing. She's an honorary member of the Society for Natural Sciences and the author of a book called Nano Comes to Life, How Nanotechnology is Transforming Medicine and the Future of Biology. Today, she will talk about how a natural system can inspire information processing and computational techniques. The title of our talk is It from Bit, The Future of Bioinspired Computing Machine Learning, or Beyond Machine Learning. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Sonia, and uh, the floor is yours. And yes, as I uh, mentioned, the talk is recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel. Thank you. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Yes, we can so, see the screen. It's... Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you for inviting me to talk. I was very hesitant to speak in this series because I'm no expert in machine learning, but I met Peter Bram, uh, who is organizing this series with Max Sense, and we were talking a lot about biological shape, which is why I'm interested about myself, and. Um, and also I decided to speak in the end because I've been following some of the talks that have been given in this um, seminar series and they're all very interesting and many of them actually are touching on biological problems. But I also thought I felt when, when I was seeing them, I felt a bit, a bit frustrated that most of these talks are, are, are missing the big picture, which is why are we using bio-inspired algorithms such as machine learning uh, based on uh, artificial neural networks to solve the uh, physical or non-physical of complex problems of the 21st century, which is, which is what we are doing. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this. I've been thinking a lot over the last 10 years of why me as a nanotechnologist started to biology and became interested in information processing and why not only me, but many people are converging as we are seeing this series into bio-inspired computing paradigms to solve their problems. So hence the title of my talk, It From Bit. It From Bit, for those of you that like quantum mechanics, you know, is a sentence by Johnny Wheeler who inspires my talk today and is one of my heroes, um, who was the first one, maybe one of the first ones to realize that there's um, a computational, and uh, you can interpret nature as a computational process. And he realized that from quantum mechanics, the idea that in order to have reality, it, you need a kind of computation, a kind of participation of the experiment in order to reality to become clear. So my argument in this talk is that it's not only the physical reality comes from a comp quantum computation, but perhaps also biological reality, comes from a physical computation, which is what we are trying to understand when we develop these um, bio-inspired algorithms. So I will take you through my vision of how we are evolving into understanding complex systems, trying to at the same time understand ourselves and our own intelligence and as physicists, why that the universe actually creates clever intelligent shapes. So as I said, I started out as a nanotechnologist and in the 1990s, people like me that were interested in how matter was behaving at the nanometer scale, we started to become interested in biological systems because we are made of nanomachines. So up to then, um, we had developed at least in the, since the 1950s onwards, since the invention of crystallography for, for proteins and for DNA, a consistently dom and, and pr an increasingly dominant picture of biology was emerging as a kind of digital computer in which you had DNA and proteins that they were bits and they will connect with each other in some kind of networks, complex ways that we didn't understand. And that was all that we needed to do to understand life. That, yet people like me were coming from materials, were coming from quantum and condensed matter physics. And we were interested in things like when you put many atoms together and they interact strongly with each other, the stuff emerges that is not like the atoms that is made from. So out of particles, out of bits can come continuum, can come emergence, can come complex systems. So 
I put my atomic force microscope that was used at the time for using nanoparticles to use uh, proteins and DNA. And I didn't find beads, I found shapes. So um, of course the proteins like this one here, this is a potassium channel, one of the proteins you have in your cell membranes that allows potassium to go in and, and doesn't allow sodium to go in. And that's one of the reasons you can function. It is um, these proteins, are the product of four billion years of evolution. One third of the age of the universe have been devoted to creating these shapes and of course have a digital part. They have a chain with a specific, a specific chain with a specific components. They're made of Lego blocks. They're put, the amino acids that are put together in the right way and they fold into the correct shape. So biological shapes at the nanoscale are not bits. They're clever combinations of bits and shape creating function. These things move a lot. Um, they are run by the principles of non-equilibrium thermodynamics. When you are a string and you are in water and you're nanoscale, you are able to create and reduce your entropy because you can dissipate energy into the environment by example, a chemical reaction or a movement. By dissipating energy into the environment, you can create a shape, you can reduce your entropy, you can encode information, and if your shape endures in time, you're already encoding information about the environment. So there's something very profound that we were starting to learn as physicists working in soft matter at the nanoscale liquid, which is what not only eat from bit in the quantum case, but is there's also an eat from bit in the soft matter case. When you're soft and you're in water and you can wriggle and you're a string, you can encode information in your shape and you can encode information in the pieces in a polymer, and polymer are made from, a, from different bits. You can encode information into the chain that makes you, but also into the way you fold yourself. You create a shape. And that shape is entangled with the energy and whatever is happening in the environment. And it's changing and responding and changing the environment itself. It's extremely complex, it's linking thermodynamics, information processes, and time and mechanics through mechanics. So eventually these things move, what we do with our microscopes, and this is why I started to create these microscopes and work with people that make these microscopes, if I manage to make this movie move, move there, is that these things move. There are mechanical shapes that are able to move. So for example, here at the top is the ATP synthase, it's a protein that you have in every single cell of your body and on every living organism. It's a rotary motor, it's the perfect nano machine. Every atom is in place, is everywhere and catalyzes a chemical reaction with almost 100% efficiency, just using the temperature of the water around it and creates rotation in order to catalyze a chemical reaction. This is very far from just a digital vision of biology that most molecular cell biology was presenting us, this is shape link with digital information. And here at the bottom is another amazing linear motor, an acting, mole an acting molecule that sits on, sorry, a, a myosin mo molecule that sits on the track. This, you have these things all over your cells and they're responsible from hearing from every movement you have, every time you have a contraction. And this relies again on the machine, able to use temperature and shape and of course the information encoded in its sequence by the 4 billion years of evolution to create amazing uh, functionality. So that is interesting enough, but of course is not the complete picture of biology and it still let me very dissatisfied when I was working on this because the whole thing of biology is that out of those little bits yet move on to another scale. So you're going across scales to create millimeter, meter sized machines that are able to integrate all this and coordinate. They need to make computations that are able to control time. So all these things are coordinated because to be able to function and to understand the keys to control the time that all the bits are working at the same time and in the right way. So, the key for me is to understand maybe a simple system, not so simple, why a leaf sees the sun and moves towards it. That is not a digital computation, it's an analog computation that is underpinned 
by digital processes. So physicists like me, and this is where it comes my frustration and, and why I move on to try to understand better information theory, got frustrated in that I can, from my biological physics world in which I live, um, I measure how these shapes emerge in a mechanical way. I measure the analog part, I measure the mechanical properties, the continuum properties in, in the whole story. Um, so like me, not only biological physicists, um, are many of us are trying in all the sciences and technologies in fact, are converging into biology. So I explore all this, why are we right now converging into biology in everything we do in my book, that I'm going to promote here, that it comes to life, which is when I first started thinking about these problems. It's very interesting historically, the idea that most of the 19th and 20th century science is quite reductionist. And there are many reasons for it. One is the, 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 the mathematics we knew, the computers and the capacity to calculate complex system we had, but also historical development of things like colonialism. But I'm talking about that tomorrow in the talk in the, in the, um, in the Japanese Studies Center here in Oxford about colonialism and physics, but not today. Um, so basically we are at the end of reductionism in a way, our computer technologies and also the kind of problems we need to solve cannot be reducted anymore to bits. We need to understand complex systems. So that means that people like me, nanotechnologies move to biology, but obviously people trying to make robots, robotics, drones for wars, um, creating new materials, materials that are smart, materials that are going to substitute steel and concrete when we make new buildings, um, are also looking into biology and how biology constructs, how biology creates wood or how biology creates other materials that are going to do the things we want to do. In the background of all this is global warming. Uh, um, of course, in itself, a very complex system, a very complex problem that produces an enormous amount of data and that will require very clever algorithms to solve. And arguably the global warming itself has been, co has been caused by the reductionist way of doing science of the 19th and 20th century. So um, basically most of the problems we're trying to tackle involve big data, um, involve complex systems that evolve with time and the computer capacities we have right now are very limited. Not on, and also our capacity to understand the physics, the actual models that will allow us to have these um, algorithms that we need in order to understand and solve these problems. So what I think now, after all these years of thinking of why we cannot solve biological problems, why we cannot solve compressed problems, and, and what is the way forward is this one. So biological systems, such as my plant or the protein I showed before, have been trying, people have been trying to under be understood by the typical biology approach with these genes and proteins. So it's a digital representation of biology, which has many limitations. One of the best arguments for this is that in the last 30 years, a reductionist approach, basically a digital approach to cancer has produced very few drugs. And the drugs that have been produced don't improve very much the outcomes of cancer treatment. And yet, for example, now with immunotherapies, which is using biology to tackle your cancer, an analog uh, system that can be primed like in the COVID vaccines, we can talk about that later if you want, with digital, um, with digital algorithms that you encode in your RNAs of, the, of, your, of your vaccine, you can actually start to tackle cancer. So biology has its limitations looking at, at, um, at biologists just from a digital point of view. However, this digital point of view is what has attracted most theoretical physicists. So theoretical physicists usually look at the interconnections between proteins and genes and the complex networks they make and use um, complex systems approaches to try to solve what is going on. Yet people like me and applied mathematicians and engineers that are trying to make applications out of biology, such as creating tissues in regenerative medicine or, 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 or COVID vaccines or, or try to understand how a plant grows, grows simply we use continuum models, differential equations, we use concepts from mechanics, 
we use models like finite elements, or we use things like electricity. And these worlds don't talk. And you can see that from the lectures, the series of lectures you were having already in your, in your series of sermons of machine learning. So the people using machine learning are usually looking at the biological approach. They're looking at trying to find the complex networks between genes and proteins, but they never talk about to the people. They're actually looking at how these networks are connected by a shape. So the analog world is not talking to the digital world to understand complex systems. And I think this is where the opportunity lies right now for um, ambitious people um, to try to join these worlds. And what I'm trying to give you in my talk is that I think there's a lot of possibilities and a lot of reasons of why would, why would you like to do that? One is physics. Uh, we want to understand why the universe creates these shapes that are so clever and how they do it. And also in physics departments, we have the tools to do this, or at least the willing to engage with people that will help us to solve these problems, which is non-equilibrium thermodynamics, as I told you at the beginning, is time, is how we control time and shape and how is that linked together with information and information theory. So I think um, this is how all this is coming together right now. You start to see examples in the literature in here and there of how many of us are trying to come to this new paradigm in which we link the analog and the digital to understand complex problems. Now, of, ah, I, I put here the, the paper of R. Louis that came out recently and, and follows up one of the seminars he gave you in your series because he's also thinking about these things. He's actually looking at more of the complex system way and, and I recommend you to, to read his, his uh, recent uh, paper, which just algorithmic arguments, he, um, um, and, and Kolmogorov complexity, he explains that in his talk uh, that you can see in the videos. Um, he explains how uh, just simply from the algorithm, nature in biological systems uh, produces symmetry. So um, in the last months, I've been talking lots to James Semple, who is sitting here in one of the only squares that is not black, and to Arjun Ardavan, um, trying to develop our own vision of how from a physics department, can we really make a difference in, in tackling complex problems in the 21st century by having this physics approach and using um, ideas from biology and nature to create biospirus So this is a little bit quickly the motivation of the ideas we have developed together. So, of course, the reason why we are using now digital computers to simulate physical phenomena and, and, and including machine learning um, to understand reality and to create new technologies is because um, our computers work really well. After they invented the transistors in 1947 and all this early development of architectures, um, well, you know, it's very, it's been good to use your computers to solve your problems. Um, we all learn how to program them and we have been trained on how to do it. The problem right now is that the type of problems we're trying to solve have too, too much amount of data and they're very complex. So the problems are becoming increasingly complicated to code and to handle. The computers are never big enough the computers in the current way they are designed semiconductors will also hit the limits. We are now in transistors below nine nanometers and there's not much further you can go. And also they spend, and this is a big problem, an enormous amount of energy. So the idea is that um, when there always exists an alternative, um, the analog computer. An analog computer is trying to um, create a, 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 an analog version of the physics you're trying to simulate in which you don't need to simulate it. You just have your device itself introducing the physics you want. So an example will be an analog computer where the electronic circuit elements um, are the differential, instantiate the differential equations that you're trying to solve. Of course, there's nothing new. And for those of you that like history of, of devices, probably you have seen recently in the press this machine, which is uh, the uh, is 2000 years old, the Antikythera uh, mechanism uh, that was found in Greece, which is an incredibly complicated analog machine full of, 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 of clever wheels that is able to produce the, the, the positions of the stars. And it's just using physics 
no, no, no digital. Of course, these ideas are not new. And the same guys that created the digital computer, uh, Alan Turing, Johnny von Neumann, and their interactions between them, they were thinking of buy and spark computing from the get go. So they were had ideas in the 1940s of indeed uh, neural networks um, and representations using neurons of how the computations were, were going to work. But again, the success of the digital computer means that we forgot all these other ways of computation until now. So as I said before, we having in the 21st century um, to tackle a lot of problems that are very complex. So from tumors or pandemics to global warming to new materials that allow our uh, the global warming not to explode. So we need this, all these are actually interconnected. And one thing we love doing and that we are seeing a lot, which is autonomous vehicles or drones. I think that the pandemic um, that we had has, is going to bring a boom in bioinspired computing, not only in the design of things as I'll take you later, but the way we design them, including things like imitating the immune system to create new computers. And the war in Ukraine in our, is already seeing a surge on, um, on the use of drones, autonomous vehicles, and all of these are using different versions of machine learning, but also swarm computing that I will review very quickly now. Uh, also increasingly analog computers. So neuromorphic computers are already being designed and used, and I don't know if they're being used in Ukraine. My guess is that I, I, I should be okay here. My guess is that, um, yes, they are, because most of these drones are actually have been tested in the wars in Syria and, and, and since 2014 in Ukraine. So as, um, this is the situation we have right now. This is where a summary of what I told you before. Um, the idea is that we take inspiration from biological systems to combine the digital and the analog. As I told you in the previous slides, biology at all its scales is using this dual code um, mixing digital with analog. So this is what I told you in words. And now um, I'm going to um, go to the summary of what I'm gonna tell you about pe what people are doing in this world of bio-inspired computing. So first I will very quickly review all the biology inspired computing models that I have found, or I found a few more, but these are the ones that are, that are most used. Implemented in digital based computers, which is how we are actually now doing things like um, machine learning based on artificial neural networks. So we get inspiration from a system that works in biological or natural world. And then we encode that into a silicon based computer. The next wave, which is starting to come out, is for me more exciting, is the cyborg um, computing revolution, which in which nature becomes the implementation hardware. So hardware and software merge into a material which can be biological, artificial, or in between. And there are already many examples of this starting to happen. And finally, um, we're going back to the concept of Johnny Wheeler and many others, um, understanding and um, trying to look at nature as a computer. Uh, I, as I see it right now, as soon as time moves forward, there is some kind of computation, um, something is going on that um, is creating uh, intelligence of some sort. And this is something that Tristan Farrell, which is in the audience, knows much more than me, and maybe we can discuss in the end. So I'm going to go very quickly um, about um, just telling you different types of inspired computing um, that are merging with artificial neural networks in machine learning. So we learn to download the machine learning um, algorithms uh, from Python, but the people working on this are, are working in many different strategies that combine with artificial neural networks to actually solve the problems they're trying to solve. The oldest uh, is the cellular automaton, which was already thought um, by von Neumann and Stahl Ulam in the 1940s. The reason was it was the 1940s is because they were working on the Manhattan Project and they were working on thinking computers together. This, um, 
So they already thought of the solar automaton, which probably you know about. This is the, perhaps the most famous ones, which is uh, the Game of Life created by John Horton Conway in the 1970s. By the way, he died of COVID during the pandemic, um, which is quite sad. Um, so basically you, you it's a, it's a final set of cells that you create and then each cell evolves in parallel at discrete time steps follow some transition rules. And by doing that, um, you create um, a computer that is able to compute in parallel, distributed fashion. There's no tape, no string of in, in instructions, but what you have the evolution of the cells stained. So basically it tells you it, it's a computer by evolution of what happens in the behavior of the cells and how they interact with each other. Of course, Stephen Wolfram has made this way of computing very popular with his, with his books. And he has this idea that the world is pixels and everything can be interpreted by cellular autonomy of some sort. Uh, many of us think that that might not be true, but anyway, particles and, 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 and continuous will always be um, the, the, the most, perhaps most um, controversial topic of physics. So these things are still used now and they use a lot for all sorts of problems, biological growth or production. I put a few here pattern formation and diffusion. One beautiful thing that happens with every computing model that all these guys were developing in the 1940s and the 1950s is that if you look somewhere in nature, you will find it implemented. These guys um, found um, that the leaves, uh, the, the, the stomatine leaves actually work by um, a, a kind of mechanism that is very similar to um, a cellular automaton. So in the leaves, you have, this is from my lab, we look at the, you have these little pores and the pores open and close uh, to optimize and the amount of um, oxygen and what they take in. So they are in the leaves, if you look in the leaves, they look like that. So they, they solve a formal optimization problem by adjusting their apertures. And although they're separate, they are actually work as connected networks, of course, because they are connected by a mechanical medium, which is what I study. I study how the time responses of this medium respond to the movement of the estomata. So shape matters. They're not only networks, they're networks con, uh, con, um, connected by uh, shape, by non-equilibrium thermodynamics, by mechanics. Um, so they synchronize. As I said at the beginning, one of the most important things in biological systems is that you need to synchronize all the bits in order to make the uh, computation. And, and they actually work like a cellular autom automaton, which is uh, amazing that time and again, you find all these things uh, in nature. So, you know, artificial neural networks, and I'm not gonna go through them because this is the, to the topics of all the other talks I've been going through. Through. They're very old. Uh, they're also from the 1940s, and they were proposed by these two guys, which were not computer scientists, and they were not physicists. Uh, they were mixtures of log logicians and, and psychologists, and they came up with the idea of, of artificial neural networks, and they attracted the work of von Neumann and others that, that relate to what we have now. Another interesting way of, uh, I'm going to check the time, um, another interesting way in, um, in making computer algorithms that is not artificial neural networks is evolutionary computation. So it's the idea of using Darwinian evolution to, to create your algorithms. So they are used in a wide range of things, uh, including uh, finance, economics, complex systems, because it's time evolved. And um, basically, they consist of uh, looking for possible solutions of a problem as individuals in the population and to include some kind of fitness to, to decide the quality of the solution. They are already used in real world applications. And I found you one nice one of an antenna made by NASA for uh, a Space Technology 5 mission in which they use um, evolutionary algorithms to create the shapes of the antennas, which are very cute. They look like little sculptures that they were using. Uh, in their, in their system. And it became uh, the first uh, evolutionary algorithm based um, thing that has been put in space as a real device. Swarm intelligence 
is becoming increasingly important in this area because it's the idea of how you connect things um, is important for companies that are trying to work on the internet of things in medical data sets, uh, heating systems, moving objects, tracking, of course, traffic. Uh, once we go to autonomous vehicles, you would like to have some kind of swarm intelligence to try to do these things move together. Um, more worryingly, um, these things are going to, and are being developed very much at the moment uh, because of the war in Ukraine. Um, so there is a lot going on right now in Ukraine of drones working together and swarming. The first time um, a, a mission by drones and swarming could kill actual soldiers apparently happened in 2014 by the Russian army in the beginning of the Ukrainian war that now has exploded. And there's already a lot of literature on the topic with a lot of um, ethical problems, I think, this will take over a lot of things, deliveries from Amazon, um, the way they track, the way we move. Um, so yes, welcome to the drone wars. And as I said, the immune system is an amazing thing that we are starting to be able to use for medical treatments. Uh, one example that we can maybe all understand is the COVID vaccines. So. Um, the COVID vaccine was an amazing example of how medicine of the future is already started, it will work. So the Chinese authorities released the, uh, uh, the sequence of DNA of the virus very early on in the days of the pandemic. And immediately uh, the teams of Moderna, BioNTech and indeed Vaxitech in Oxford, uh, within days using machine learning algorithms and whatever they took, they designed their vaccines. Um, they had vaccines ready for clinical trials within weeks. Uh, these vaccines are combinations of nanotechnology, and in the case of Moderna and BioNTech, with uh, RNA uh, technology, immunology, and a great understanding or a better understanding of the immune system. The idea that you can get the immune system to tackle not only um, pandemics or, or viruses, but actually cancer, which what motivated these companies to exist in the first place. Both Moderna and BioNTech are over 10 years old. And they were trying to use the cleverness, the analog cleverness on the, of the immune system to tackle cancer. And, and eventually they, they help us to, to survive so far the pandemic. Um, I expect um, people have been using artificial new immune systems in digital format for a while. Um, for things like um, antivirus in your computers. Uh, but I expect that the search and research in immune system will also bring us a search and systems that use immune, um, this um, the inspiration from immune systems to create new algorithms. Another area that is quite interesting um, and that is inspired a lot of new applications is the idea that if the more we know about the connectivity of neurons in living systems, it can help us to design algorithms um, such as artificial neural networks that are first made for specific purposes. So um, an interesting project that I bring here is Open Warm, which belongs to the artificial life type of bio-inspired computing. So in Open Warm, people just look at how the neurons of C. elegans, C. elegans is a little worm that um, biologists use for many, many years as their model system to understand many things because it's very easy to grow in the lab and it's transparent. And also has um, a very interesting um, a range of neurons. They don't have so many neurons. And interesting, they have the same amount of genes as humans, these little worms. Um, so um, people are trying to understand how the um, architecture of the neurons actually affects the way the, the, the worm behaves. So they are implementing algorithms that are mimic as accurately as possible the interconnections between these neurons, and then they put them in little robots. And these little robots have sensors that try to imitate in a very, not very sophisticated way, as you can see, the sensing abilities of the worm. And by doing biology, computers and robotics, we're trying to create 
new ways to understand how is the awareness of this um, uh, worm of the world. People are already using these um, for real world robotic applications, including uh, all, all sorts of things that um, are coming up with in, in cities, even for, for, for navigating through pipes, etc. There are many other ways in which people are trying this approach. Um, is the idea of, is quite philosophical, uh, how life arises from inner matter, where are the living? So basically is, is, is in, a, in a bit, it's a good summary of how all of us are converging in these very fundamental questions. Why the universe creates matter that is intelligent and what does it mean? Another example of membrane computing, which is based on uh, ideas also from, from biology, the way the uh, proteins are embedded in the cell membrane, the membranes of the cell communicate the inside world and the outside world, and many problems people have thought that can be um, solved, such as some problems of cryptography or, or, or uh, computer graphics with this approach. I find this a very interesting way of making algorithms, which is called amorphous computers. So basically, this you can see here a wave. Um, I got it from a lab in MIT that is working on this. This wave is similar to the way um, eco, um, Drosophila, these little flies that biologists study. There's a lot of work right now in understanding how um, the embryo develops into the shape of the fly, um, their feces, their uh, all sorts of people working on these problems. Each of us are working on it separate. Nobody talks to each other. And these ones are making their computer approach to this problem. So trying to understand the engineering principles that can be used uh, to observe, control, organize, and exploit the behavior of programmable multitudes. Basically what they're trying to mimic is how cells communicate to each other in order to create shape over time. Um, so that is my summary of what people are trying to do to implement bio-inspired computing models into digital computers. For me, the most interesting part, and is the why I'm starting to work on, is in the next wave, um, nature as implementation hardware. The idea that you can get your software and your hardware within the same system. So this story starts with molecular, or maybe not, but I guess this was one of the early examples with uh, Adelman, which I read his work when I was doing my PhD in Japan. And he was the first one that proposed that DNA could be used as a computer. This idea has been taken by many people. He proposed this idea in the 1990s and it's taken a long time to realize it's not easy to make a molecular computer. I um, encourage you to look at this paper that was published by people of our department um, uh, last week, but John Bath, Eric Benson, Raphael in the group of Andrew Trabifu created, they all created this um, beautiful um, DNA molecular printer capable of programmable positioning and patterning in two dimensions using DNA. So again, the idea that you can create a machine um, that encodes shape, uh, function, and digital information within itself. The most uh, used and already making an impact in our world is neuromorphic computer. Uh, neuromorphic computer where Carver made thought about them many, many years ago. And is the idea that you can use the solid state devices that are in your computers not as digital, but as analog devices. So you can use them a little bit more like brain, uh, in sort of like neurons, um, not digital, but um, analog neurons. A lot of people are investing a lot in this. Um, so um, Neurogrid in, in, uh, in Stanford, the Human Brain Project in European Union has 1.3 billion been allocated to the project to try to understand a little bit what I was telling you before with a worm, how the connectivity of the neurons in the human brain can lead to um, neuromorphic computing and the other way around. Can we use neuromorphic computer to understand better the working of the human brain? So IBM is also working on this, brain scales, and perhaps the most advanced is the IMEC, uh, which is a, a research institute in Belgium. Oh, stop. 
um, has created a neuromorphic computer that is already being um, in use. Heidelberg uh, has brain scales. And as far as I know, I think these brain scales are already implemented in a drone. Who knows where these drones are gonna be deployed. And a drone is the perfect place to test a neuromorphic computer because what a neuromorphic computer and an analog computer that is to be very fast. It doesn't have to go through the algorithm, the response like we respond. We have memories in our brains, but we also have emotions and feelings and we can respond very quickly to whatever is going on without having to do a computation, just with our analog capacity. And this is what this type of computers implemented in, in um, this, in, um, in drones are trying to do. So out of my frustration of doing biology, just thinking about mechanics and thermodynamics and not being able to um, do um, information process, I created or uh, a kind of network people interested in these problems. And this is my first project that we are trying to get funding for with Brains in a Dish. So it's a collaboration with Antoine Jerusalem in engineering Yoshikatsu Hayashi in the University of Reading. He's very good at robotics and soft robotics and a neuroscientist, mainly David Dupre here in Oxford. Um, so what we're trying to create is a neural network on a dish. And we are going to try to understand what get neurons to oscillate um, and, and coordinate, for example, in the gamma frequency band. The gamma frequency band is, is linked to uh, consciousness. Basically, neuroscientists now think that in order to be conscious and put together all the different information we get from the outside world, like hearing or seeing, and that all comes into a coherent picture, the neurons need to oscillate in this frequency uh, range. We're trying to make cells oscillate in a frequency range. Um, my student, Hendrik, had the idea of using piezoelectric lithium niobate substrates to achieve these. And um, our, I think, what gives us an edge uh, against other people trying to understand this is that we will try to understand and put together the physics, the non-equilibrium thermodynamics and the information theory, theory the information uh, processing of the neurons. We are planning to connect our neurons to the outside world or to a computer to see in real time how the neurons evolve as they are getting information. So this will be our brain in a dish. Um, and this is also led by a student in my lab, Yuan Min, who is there, who is trying to make new materials so we can get better recordings for mice that we are able to feed into our chip eventually. Related to this way of thinking is the people working on synthetic biology. So synthetic biology is the idea that we can hack into the kind of code that makes uh, life possible. So we can use, for example, cells at factories of the materials of the future. Um, so the manufacturing process that is able to hack into the digital and the analog capacities of, of, um, of cells in order to create materials. I said analog, although most of, of the idea behind digital uh, synthetic biology is actually digital, and they are mainly looking at genes and proteins. Um, perhaps the most interesting of this area is protein engineering. I think you had a talk about how um, these guys, um, deep learning, um, a deep mind could, could be used, AlphaFold, could be used to predict protein structures. This work follows the, the work of AlphaFold, follows the work of decades of work of people like David Baker, that they were developing the algorithms that they allow them to actually predict the structures of proteins. It's not just machine learning. In order to create these algorithms, the key is not the algorithm of machine learning, but it's actually to take into account the evolutionary history of the protein that allows you to make a computation that correctly folds the protein to the correct shape. The most interesting thing of this is that these guys not only stayed in predicting protein structures, what they're doing now, almost immediately after they're able to do that, is to create proteins in the computer that they don't exist in nature, go back to the cells, like in an artificial, like in synthetic biology approach, and get cells, yeast or whatever, to produce these proteins that don't exist in nature. 
This is proper nanotechnology. This is designed in a computer, something with atomic precision. Atoms, every atom is in place in these complex structures and you get cells to build them. So these guys now are able to produce very complex assemblies that are designed in the computer and the computer program itself is, is just beautiful from the computational point of view, because it does, as I said, the key here is not just a normal computation like physicists do. It's not just a simulation taking into account the physics. You need evolution, the evolutionary history of life on earth in order to create these structures. And they're so quick that one of the students of the lab that now has his own lab created a vaccine within weeks again, against COVID that is already in clinical trials based on this. This is proper, clever nanotech. Um, the total design of a structure all the way down to single atoms and uh, amazing. And based on so many clever ideas of biology, of physics, of computer science. Um, I love printing and our technology. There's such an example of how things will be in the future. Another, and this is related, is the idea I told you before, there were evolutionary algorithms that will tell you things in silico, how evolution of things, how evolution of, of, of a process will happen a bit like the game of life. What is gonna happen now in the 21st century is that the combination of, of what we know about evolution and the software we can create and things like 3D printing will allow us to create hardware that is able to evolve the evolution of things. Um, so this is again, will take us to ways we're not now and we don't even know where we are. We, we will be able to design materials for applications that it can be replaced by itself um, as it needed. Um, and it's not so difficult right now, even with the technologies we have some, right now to start creating this. Let me introduce you to the Cenobots. Michael Levin is a biologist that have been interested for many years in understanding how biological shape emerges, not just from genes, but from electricity. And he had this idea together with his collaborators of creating the Cenobots. They create living, these things, these little blobs are made of uh, tissue engineers. So basically you get polymers and you put cells on them. They're cells from frogs. And these things, they create them. So it's a little bit like the game of life, but proper. I mean, these little things are there, they're fed. And for a strange, in a very strange mechanism, I, I, I very much encourage you to look at this paper, they're able to self-replicate. Um, nobody knows what these things will be used for, but right now we have already living toys that can replicate. And I'm moving just finally to the next frontier. I started my talk with it from BIT, uh, from Johnny Wheeler. And I think another area where quantum computing, sorry, with the, with the ideas of computing are being totally changed is quantum computing, as you know. The idea, again, of using nature to creating new ways of computation. But there are interfaces between quantum computing, quantum devices, quantum technologies, and biology is the idea that proteins are in that interface between the quantum and the classical, there are three nanometers across, they usually operate in classical as far as we know, but some of them may not be operating just on classical principles, especially all these proteins that are interacting with light, for example, can be suspicious that they might be doing some kind of quantum computation. So people at Oxford, including Tristan Farrow, are trying to look at biological systems for inspiration to trying to find what might be the design of the quantum devices of the future. I also think that all these algorithms will help us to identify the proteins that are looking for that might have this quantum uh, computing capacities and my interest here could be to understand um, lessons from nature, lessons from biology, to try to do, uh, remove um, the noise that will allow us to create a compound computer at high temperatures. Biological systems need to control noise. Um, they work on thermal fluctuation, and yet they perform 
tasks that go just over these thermal fluctuations. I also have the suspicion that in some biological systems, biology might be able to freeze enough the thermal fluctuation so that quantum systems can actually happen. Many of the systems that are in nature that are suspected to be uh, quantum are actually crystalline in the biological structure, such as this one, um, bacterial dopsin on which I work for, and also um, magnetic reception uh, rods in, in, the, in, in the eyes of birds, etc. So to finish, um, this of course is creating computing and creating materials and creating uh, stuff out of inspired by biology. But what all these leaders is actually the underlying principle of all this is that there is a value in looking at nature as a computer. The capacity of matter to um, the, the idea that we can look at nature from an infor information perspective um, is very, um, promising for people like me, as I showed you at the beginning, my plant that turns into the sun, I really think that the only way to integrate all these different visions of biological processes is by integrating digital and analog, non-equilibrium thermodynamics and information theory. Um, yeah, this is what I just said without a picture. So of course, this a bit my plans and what I'm trying to do just to finish, I tell you that there's nothing new here. He, uh, physicists have always tried to understand why we understand nature. And it's been a combination of social forces and technological forces that are completely pushing us into this idea of understanding the capacity of nature to create intelligence. So the line over here is a bit of a history of physics in the 20th century. And at the bottom part is, is a bit more the mathematics and the information theory. So if you look at this line, even though as physicists, we, we, don't, we are not told very often to think that we are looking for complexity and intelligence. In fact, this is, I argue, what we've been looking for from the beginning. So we have started from elemental particles and quantum mechanics and just looking at particles. But very early on, um, we started to look at how individual particles interact with each other and emerge into things like superconductivity, like Lev Landau ideas. It started in Kharkiv, as they are now being bombed. It's very sad to think. Um, Erwin Schrodinger in 1944, his first um, idea of how non-equilibrium thermodynamics will lead to life. He made a prediction of the existence of DNA that then it was proved by, again by techniques involved by uh, a developing physics department, X-ray diffraction. Here's Rosalind Franklin looking at the structure of DNA. Um, the first things we turn our microscopes to is life. And we, we are obsessed in where are we made of. Of course, Jean-Pierre Dejean with, with polymer physics, the idea that you can create materials for soft matter physics. And as I argue today in my talk, now this is linking with information theory, the idea that soft matter and nanoscale soft matter polymers actually link non-equilibrium thermodynamics with information processing. As soon as the computer, uh, as, the, as the transistor was invented, People use it for complex systems, fractal chaos theory, which linked to non-equilibrium thermodynamics, the work of Ilya Prigozhin, Lars Onsager, trying to understand how energy, I use his principles actually to understand how plants grow. And at the same time, all these guys, uh, starting from um, Gödel's incompleteness theory, uh, the idea of what can you learn from a logic system and what is outside your logic system, inspired Alan Turing to try to make a computer to understand what can you understand with a machine and what kind of machine knows. And as I've been telling you today through my lectures in the Manhattan Project already von Neumann and Stanulam, in here in the middle we have Richard Feynman, maybe looking somewhere else, you know, but engaged with a computer discussion, Claude Shannon linking a structure, entropy and computing. And we finish here um, with a lecture of Johnny Wheeler in 1889 in the um, Santa, Santa Fe um, Institute of Complex Systems, trying to link information, physics, and quantum, um, the search for links. Here's where we are now in biology. We're just uh, how many years? Uh, 40, 30 years behind um, Johnny Wheeler, trying to find our it from bit um, in soft matter physics. 
So um, I think I'll, I'll finish here. Um, I'll just tell you one beautiful example, again, of biology and how other people are trying to do it. Um, so Toshiyuki Naga, um, Nakagaki from Hokkaido University started a few years ago to interrogate how moles compute. So there's a search and research on this thing, Physarum polycephalum, which is a mold that rots wood. And this mold is found to create amazing networks able to solve very complex geometrical computational problems looking for food. So his work is inspired a lot of experiments and computer scientists are starting to try to understand how fungi are able to create, a, create, actually have a language, an electrical language. They produce this oscillation similar to brains um, to communicate with each other. Um, so this is a beautiful paper that came recently uh, demonstrated that um, the fungal world lengths are much that of human languages. Um, we are just starting to discover the world of computation in biological systems, as I told you before, and this is my final slide. I think with uh, the right framework of research, a truly uh, transformative way in which we do technology and we understand nature will come about, not just with machine learning, but with all these bio-inspired computing tools that I briefly or too longly describe in my talk today. And I finish with Johnny Wheeler, uh, my hero of my talk, and, and one beautiful sentence where he's playing his insight into the idea that nature creates matter, creates intelligence um, out of a computation. And maybe I, I just read the last bit. Uh, Reality arises in the last analysis from the posing of a yes and no question and the registering of equipment evoke responses. Here's the analog part of Johnny Wheeler. In short, all things physical are information theoretic in origin and that we live in a participatory universe. And with that, I ask for your participation on uh, questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. So indeed, uh, uh, virtual clapping for our speaker and uh, thanks again for uh, bringing a subject that we do not often see in these seminars and very interesting to see uh, this different perspective. So if anyone has any question, do raise your hand or don't hesitate to ask it already if uh, there's no one else uh, in the queue. They're already bored. <laughs> and they're no, going yeah, you want to go home? Yeah, usually at first, this is a bit more uh, um, shy. So I actually, I have a very naive question because this is really not my field, but you, you mentioned uh, the use of neuromorphic uh, chips, I think, for example, and you mentioned that these different sub elements would be able to compute together. But you then also mentioned the parallel with the human being where you had the appearance of large scale behaviors, such as emotion, which are probably I don't know if they directly intended in the machinery, but they do appear. And I was wondering if these uh, biologically inspired um, machines do not suffer from problems of stability and control um, and do not have this emergence of uh, uncontrolled behavior. Well, of course, it's all, well, depending on how you're going to implement it, the biological ones are very difficult to control. And all these people doing synthetic biology in one way or another, they're very difficult things to make. Um, so. The difficult things to think about, the difficult things to understand, um, and, and yeah, they're they're not easy to implement. I don't uh, know myself much about neuromorphic computing. I just um, implemented with um, semiconductor devices. I know there's a lot of interest, and um, the idea that they just mimic architectures in brains. Um, of some sort or imaginary brains in order to produce tasks, a little bit like what I was showing you about the worm. I get this is all still very preliminary in many cases, not um, because they need to evolve the computer system together with the application. That's why I think drones is one of the areas that they will use it. Yes, I guess they do have problems of stability. And, uh, and, and I guess um, 
these are the, the, the things they're trying to tackle. I think it's all at the moment very trial and error where, where things are going on. Uh, but maybe someone in the audience knows more about this than me. No, nope. <laughs> quiet. That's also a very interesting idea. This is probably a very naive question as well, but um, is there, well, given that you're saying it's hard to control these, um, do, do we have any concerns about producing things that are self-replicating? Yeah, um, I think in the case of the xenobots, you wouldn't, because as soon as you don't feed them, they will die, and they are difficult to keep alive. The things, I mean, they're all in a pot, they're tiny, and then they need a lot of food to keep alive and they need temperature and this is not gonna go anywhere. I, will, I do have ethical issues and we will have ethical issues very quickly. So, especially in things like what I will try to do, things like, you know, neurons in a, in a pot that are start to interact with a virtual world, what are we making there? In as long as it's just that, it's fine. If we put them in a robot, I think we have a huge amount of ethical issues coming up. There's no way to do this research without going away from that. And, um, and uh, luckily, because of nanotechnology, actually, we have quite good research, responsible research and innovation protocols in place. They were evolved, uh, developed by the European Union and now implemented anywhere. But increasingly so in this area of cyborgs, we're gonna to need to have very strict understanding of what we want to make. I don't think we should make whatever we want or what is possible, but what we think is a good idea, a good idea to make. Um, Tristan has a question. Hi, sorry, uh, I'll unmute and on video myself. Thanks for that very interesting talk. I thought it was a great sort of vision overview of, of uh, fields I didn't even know existed, to be honest. Um, it's more a comment. Um, what do you think are the barriers to entry? So at the beginning, you said that uh, we need to bridge this divide between um, the analog and, and the digital worlds. Um, and I couldn't help noticing in one you the penultimate slide that most of these people were theoretical physicists, apart from Rosalind Franklin, I think. Um, and from my own experience, uh, trying to bridge this uh, divide, um, I find that talking to, say, biologists or, biolog or um, biologists talking to physicists, we don't necessarily speak the same vocabulary. So it might have been OK to design these basic ab initio principles for, you know, Gödel and Turing and all these guys. <laughs> but uh, nowadays, I think you do need some knowledge. Uh, for, well, for me, of biology and vice versa of, of, of physics for, for the biologists. Uh, so I was just, you know, it's more, as I said, a comment than, than a question, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I do have, because I'm a biological physicist. Um, and, and first thing is that there's a lot of physicists that actually know of biology like me, and they work with living systems. Biology has moved to the physics department, and that will facilitate that interface. Uh, many of us are used to work with biological systems. We can grow cells and we can work with biologists, uh, more or less. I think is even more, in a way, I think, what we do now is that in, in physics labs, we do analog digital. So we do an experiment trying to understand a physical phenomena. An experiment and the experimental equipment is an analog computer that is trying to extract the physics. Once we have that experiment, we extract the physics in a way we can code, and then we go into the simulation of that phenomena. I think what we're trying to moving forward is integrate it all, which is increasingly how we are all working. Um, so the experiment, the analog experiment, biological or quantum or quantum crystal, or is linked to the to to the digital model in itself. I think we are already doing it, but we do it in separate places or maybe um, in separate people. You have the theoretical physics or the simulator physics and then your experimental physics. So it's all put all together in a chip. It, this is a bit what we are trying to do here, which is a bit what I'm trying to say. The future of computer is something like the hardware and the software is, so the experiment and the simulation is in your chip. 
and you can, um, I don't know how we are going to implement that. Uh, I gave you some ideas of how things might be looking, but I think that's what we are already doing. Uh, we are doing that. Um, so for example, when, I when people are trying to understand tumors, the idea was to look for the genes and all that, that doesn't work. And then you have engineers that make tumor models in a dish, or you can make organoids that make the tumor model in a dish. That's your analog computer. So now the task is to extract from there the, 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 the information, which is what is missing. So all these analyses are based on either the biological way of seeing things, which is very basic network, complexity network, or the physics uh, continuum way of doing things. So I think it's the bridging of the two, which I think is what you're working conceptually, um, linking information theory with, with, with non-equilibrium thermodynamics, the, the continuum and the digital is the big challenge. So that's why I think this has to be done in a physics department, at least partially <laughs> anyway. Okay, <laughs> enough. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, I don't know if you still have a question, Justin, your hand is still raised. Uh, sorry, I just forgot to put it down. Uh, yes. Just maybe I'll make, you can, no, I can make another comment, which is that uh, on the, on the bio-inspired bio computing side, um, one interesting uh, point is that um, some of these, uh, for instance, if you take DNA base pairings, uh, the amount of energy per base pairing, which you can in this paradigm look at as a logical step or a logical gate, is about 100 kT uh, unit of energy. And if you look at classical computers, uh, each computational step uh, is roughly of the order of 1,000 to 10,000 kT. Um, so I think that'd be... A, if it's possible, a great advantage in uh, mimicking or uh, building co uh, computers out of, um, let's say, DNA or organic th systems that are much more efficient. Um, and, um, and, you know, that would solve some of the issues that uh, in we encounter with heating, for example, in, in, in classical computers at the moment. But anyway, that's, again, more a common question. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of things in which we can we can learn from biological systems that the problem will be to get the right people talking to the right people and having the right structures that allow people to create those computers i think their ideas are all there and as i showed today the ideas are there from the 1940s um, with nanotechnology means that now we have the means to manipulate and observe and create computers for example with molecules and now we even have physicists that understand biology. Um, so I think the, all the pieces of the jigsaw are there is just the willingness or the capacity to, to actually make some of these things happen. Thank you. Interesting. I actually had a question myself related to this because I come from uh, high energy physics where we obviously have the CERN, which is a really large uh, and Fermi lab and many different very big national labs or co or international labs where people collaborate on these things. And I was wondering if this field also has such labs or is more shared between universities and private labs. The main problem of this field is that nobody talks to anybody. And this is the reason I made this talk. Uh, nobody will tell you this story because nobody talks to anybody. The biologists have their visions, the physicists have their visions, the engineers have the visions. I think for me, computing actually put all this research into the framework of computing uh, from a physics perspective, will give it uh, will is the only way to really tackle big medical problems and also big complexity problems. And um, so, my contribution, if you want, is to put all the story together uh, and at least put all the pictures together so people see they are related, and that the biggest breakthroughs will come from understanding biological and complex systems from physics um, of non-equilibrium and information theory. Well, but we don't collaborate, idea. but we don't collaborate. We need a CERN of biology. That'd be interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, a, that's clear. We need a CERN of biology. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's um, the lessons of organization from the particle physics. Maybe that's what we need here, yeah. Well, that sounds interesting indeed. <laughs>
Um, I don't know if anyone else in the audience uh, wants to ask a last question. Uh, yes, David. David. Hi, Sonia, and thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, you're, you're, the topics that you mentioned of information theory and um, um, physics, it's, uh, it, it reminded me of um, work by Carl Friston on free energy principle. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you heard of this, but I'm, I'm wondering if um, what relation your work has to it. Does it interface with it at all? Or I don't know. What is the free energy principle? Um, well, essentially, it's, it's, um, it's a, a framework that he uses to describe the organization of biological systems, mm -hmm. where um, they, or essentially a biological, biological system will have a, a predictive model of the world and it tries to take actions in order to minimize its um, sensory prediction error. Yeah, I guess this is similar to the, um, I didn't discuss this there to the, yeah, so there are several ways in which people understand this. So you, you, you do it from energy. Um, Kolmogorov Uspensky, which are Russian mathematicians, and actually, Art Louis in his talk was talking about Kolmogorov complexity, the idea that algorithms are always going to look for the uh, a simple, the smallest Kolmogorov complexity, but also that um, biology um, might be implementing algorithms um, that try to minimize things and, and lead to symmetry, not only information, not only structure, but also energy. Um, I think, again, many people have thought about these issues from different perspectives, from energy perspective and from information perspective. Um, and, and it's our task now, I think, to put all this information together to see if we create a more profound picture of information processing in biological systems. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult because it's, it's difficult maths and it's difficult physics. But I think this is where we are now. And I, I, you can see more and more people trying to unify these things. For me, the main problem is fragmentation. Um, different fields don't talk to other fields and um, it's gonna very be very difficult to make progress um, if we don't talk to each other. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And I, I think it's probably time to close. So maybe we can give another virtual a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you very much for this super interesting talk and uh, have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so okay. much. And yes, to, to, just to answer the question that I answered uh, recently, uh, we will share the talk uh, in the normally tomorrow during the day. Okay. So it will be made available on, uh, on Friday. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to see me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.